Hey everyone, welcome back to Beyond the Lens Productions, where we explore the automotive world from all angles. Let's continue on the road uh, with the Pontiac Grand Prix. The 1963 model year, although it was only the second year that the vehicle was actually in production, returned that year with a completely new look and further differentiation from other Pontiacs. Uh, it and all full-size Pontiacs that year received a completely redesigned body with a much more modern look. Any design cues that you people had become familiar with from the 1950s had completely evaporated by this point. The bodies were much more angular and much more hard-edged. Undoubtedly, the most dramatic change from the 1962 model was the introduction of the famed Pontiac stacked headlamps. Pontiac's design leadership was unparalleled at the time. By 1967, Ford Chrysler and AMC had also adopted the same headlight lamp treatment as Pontiac but never did it quite as effectively as Pontiac did. Another design cue that Pontiac used very effectively were their dramatic Coke bottle side panels. The term uh, Coke bottle refers to the tucking in of the top and bottom of the body sides. If you look at an old style Coca-Cola bottle laid on its side, the analogy will make much more sense to you. <laughs> The 1963 Pontiac has been seen by many affection autos as a true first Grand Prix. For some reason, a lot of people seem to want to ignore the 1962 model. Not sure why, but anyhow, I guess because they went down a completely different route uh, in 1963. Not sure. The funny thing was, even in 1977... A uh, dealer brochure that Pontiac put out actually incorrectly named 1963 as the first year of the Pontiac Grand Prix. This car, along with many other full-size 1963 Pontiacs, is credited with changing the look Detroit uh, was offering at this time. It was completely different from what it had seen in the several years leading up to the 63. Um, the Grand Prix featured grill-mounted round signal lights and was set off by signal horizontal chrome strips. The body sides of the car were free of gratuitous trim uh, except for the Grand Prix's block lettering on the front fenders and molding for the rocker panels and wheel openings. The Grand Prix's powertrain lineup was revised a bit from the year before, but it wasn't a complete transformation from what everybody had seen. The base engine was still the 303 horsepower 389 with 3 speed, 4 speed, and uh, or automatic. The 230 horse regular fuel engine was again available with an automatic only option and the 313 horse. Tri-Power 389 was also a carryover with the same transmission uh, choices as the year previous. The big news for 63 was the addition of two street versions of the 421 Pontiac engines, which joined the 320 horse 4-barrel, which came online in late 62, where the 421, 320, was only available in 62 with the Slim Jim automatic manual transmission were also available with this engine. The two new 421 were high output power plants. The first used single four barrel carburetors and was rated at 353 horsepower at 5,000 RPMs with 455 pound feet of torque. The top street engine for 63 was a 421 HO tri-power 
with 370 horsepower and a whopping 460 feet pound of torque. And it was especially powerful in a flexible power plant. A 63 Grand Prix equipped with the Motor Trend Road Test clicked off a 0 to 60 times 6.6 .6 seconds, covering the quarter mile in 15.1 seconds at 94 miles per hour. Even with its 400 plus pound curb weight, the 421 Tripar made the Grand Prix a true performance automobile. Let's continue our exploration of the Pontiac Grand Prix as we move into the 1964 model year. With an all-new body style that came out in 1963, Pontiac chose not to make any major changes this year. At the time, it was customary to make changes in a three-year cycle. The first year was to introduce a car, then refine it in the following year. The third year, the cycle would begin. The styling changes for 1964 cleaned up the design a bit further than they were before. While retaining the styling cues, that made a Grand Prix a Grand Prix. Up front, the headlights were Frenched, where the previous year they were cut into the fender. The front bumper framed the lower headlights more than in the past. Similarly, the grille treatment was updated with a fine horizontal slant arrangement. The turn signals remained in the grill cavity, but were now rectangular with rounded corners. The large chrome support bars did not make the cuts. Inside, the 64 Grand Prix interior really wasn't that much different than the 63. There were minor trim and appointment changes, and similarly, the same story applied to the powertrains. Again, the 389 four-barrel was standard, but when Mara mated with a manual transmission, it boosted an additional 3 horsepower up to 306. The automatic transmission stayed at 303 horsepower. The 230 horse uh, low compression 389 was still the economy engine of choice, though it did only still have an automatic transmission only option. Even though there was minimum changes to the Pontiac Grand Prix in 1964, much about Pontiac and GM was very different this year. This was the first full year of operation under the GM Racing ban. So much of his effort uh, in racing was now being concentrated on street performance cars and engines. The biggest news, of course, was the deletion of the Super Duty Racing Program and the introduction of the GTO which would put performance in the hands of the masses, rather than just a few elite drag and oval track racing teams. Though the legendary 421 Super Duty was gone, there was still a lot of performance to be had in the Grand Prix. The truth be told, this hardly made any difference, as just 19 421 Super Duty Grand Prix were ever built in the two model years that they were available. Not exactly what one would call a significant number, yet uh, those previously few that remain are extremely desirable collector cars as their Catalina and Tempest brethren. Though the loss of the Pontiac Racing Program was a blow to the teams that raced them, there were actually some positive results. Pontiac was available to seamlessly divert their efforts towards street performance without losing any of the momentum they had built up. Market planners realize that racing cars need performance, but performance cars don't necessarily need to race. Engineers who built this um, Super Duty program were now focusing their attention on street engines. The end product was a dynasty of excellence and some of the finest street racing uh, performance engines to ever come out of Detroit. For 1964, there were 389 uh, and 421 cubic inch engines and a variety of power ratings. The first engine optioned up from the standard 389 tri-power uh, with a 10.75 to 1 compression ratio. It was rated at 330 horsepower and 430 foot-pound of torque. 
The next step up was a standard 421 four barrel with a slightly lower 10.5 to 1 compression ratio. Uh, it developed 320 horsepower and 450 foot pound of torque. While the 421 was a full 10 horses down from the 389 tri power, it was 25 foot pounds more torque, maxing out 400 RPMs lower in the power range. When the 421 was ordered with the tri power, things began to get a little interesting. There were two versions, the milder 350 horse version that used Pontiac's standard camshaft and exhaust manifolds. The top dog engine was the famous 421 HO, which was good for a very impressive 370 horsepower and 460 foot pound of torque. This was a brutal engine, especially coupled with the four speed manual transmission and performance at rear axle ratio. The 63 X400 received a major facelift for the 1964 show season. The car was a strong predictor of things to come, as the front end and styling it was used later in the 66 Grand Prix and GTO, almost completely intact. The car was now painted dark burgundy and was quite a hit on the International Auto Show uh, in New York City that year. It was also displayed at the 1964 New York City World's Fair. Factory records indicate that at least one 1964 Grand Prix four-door was assembled at the Doraville, Georgia plant. Parker Little, a retired GM employee that worked there at the time, recalled that the car and the circumstances of its manufacture in a 1990 interview. It seems that the owner of the large Miami Pontiac dealer fell in love with the Grand Prix styling in 64, but his wife wasn't quite as enthusiastic because uh, the car was only available in a uh, two-door. It just so happened the dealer was good friends with GM President at the time, and he uh, had some considerable influence to push through an order uh, right through their corporate red tape. Some temporary tooling had to be constructed to build a car mostly for the interior. Little recall, this was very special Grand Prix that had custom front and rear door panels and rear seat cushions. It also sported bucket seats. Council, and Mr. Little adds, was loaded in all respects and it is not clear as to what engine the Grand Prix was built with. Sales for production Grand Prix dropped off this year a bit by about 10,000 units to 63,810. This was partially due to the introduction of the Catalina 2 Plus 2, a sport coupe that actually approached the Grand Prix in terms of price when heavily optioned. Also, the competition was starting to catch up with the Grand Prix and noticing what they were doing. And a new generation T-Bird sold 92,465 units that year, well above the Grand Prix. Other cars in the GP's class also ate into the sales as well. Cars as 300 and the Buick Riviera were not selling as well as the Grand Prix, neither were the Oldsmobile Starfire and Jetstar 1. Though collectively, they were taking a significant bite out of the G Grand Prix sales. I hope you guys are enjoying this classic car series as much as I am actually researching it and yeah, even learning some things about these cars that I didn't even know myself. So please stay tuned as I move on into the next generation of the Grand Prix, which spans from 1965 to 1968 and see uh, what GM was up to in these years. Thank you for watching my video. Please subscribe to the channel and have yourself a great day. Don't forget to like the video before you leave. Leave a comment below. Subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell so you'll be notified of any upcoming videos. Thank you for watching and have a great day.